Good evening, I'm Dr. Greenbrier Almond, and thank you for joining us on our program, Tender Loving Care. Each week on Channel 3, I'm happy to talk about this interface between Christianity and medicine. And tonight I'm going to share with you some uh, stories from a section of a recent book that I've published, uh, Stories of a West Virginia Doctor's Son. <clears throat> this is written in the tradition of my father's book, who wrote while he was still alive, Stories of a West Virginia Doctor. It had such success across the state of West Virginia uh, that I was encouraged in 2005, following an accident, to write 77 more stories of his practice, and that uh, was tender loving care stories of a West Virginia doctor. Uh, the tender loving care part, of course, comes from our show here on Channel 3, uh, as we title it. And uh, Dad had told uh, some 70 stories on the program, and those were recorded, and I could use those to accurately tell his stories uh, in a second book of his. <clears throat> but uh, upon the uh, announcement by Maria that she was pregnant, and then Yasmin, uh, my daughter-in-law, that she was pregnant, first my daughter, then the daughter-in-law, uh, I was uh, inspired <coughs> to, to tell the stories that I would want my grandchildren to know about what it was like to grow up with, with a father uh, like Harold David Almond, a country doctor, a mother who was a dedicated mother, um, had attended West Virginia Wesleyan College, uh, majoring in home ec, I think with the sole purpose of uh, being a fine mother and raising a fine family, growing up as a PK, a preacher's kid, a special way to grow up in our society. And um, so they have stories, and, and I wanted to tell those stories to our grandchildren when they were born. Well, we've been blessed. Now we have uh, Eliza, uh, born last January, and then we have Harper Rose, born last April. <clears throat> and they're healthy and they're coming along. And so just about a month ago, I was able to publish stories of a West Virginia doctor's son. <clears throat> and I, I, I'm not going to read these stories per se, but I would like to tell them to you uh, in our program format, uh, at least uh, a section at a time, uh, from time to time. Uh, we will continue, of course, to have guests and, and talk about areas of tender loving care as they come up in our community. We always have those areas. Um, I know right now this is a renewal of the 4-H um, calendar and, and clubs are getting started and I would like to emphasize the importance of 4-H. I know that this is uh, particularly uh, a breast cancer awareness week and and I would always want to highlight uh, the suffering that people go through and also the spiritual road that takes people uh, deeper than they would ever imagine they could go when they have that diagnosis of cancer so there are always other topics to talk about but tonight I want to share with you a few stories about family life uh, the family life growing up, up up on the hill behind the city park in Buchanan West Virginia uh, we moved uh, back from Nebraska uh, about uh, 1949. I was about two years old, one and a half, two years old, and um, <clears throat> I, I don't remember much of that, but um, we arrived in Buchanan and uh, dad and mom rented a house, uh, sort of a split house, uh, half of a house, that Dr. Russ Meisel and his family rented in the other half. This was down just below where the current uh, Kanoa Lounge is, formerly the Kanoa Theater, and a part of what the land, a part of what is now uh, the um, First Community Bank drive-in bank area. And there were, I think there were three houses there, maybe four houses, uh, <clears throat> and we had one that uh, had in the side yard Jawbone Creek that was exposed. And I remember um, hearing about this, that I, that I played in the creek, and, I, and perhaps even almost drowned. Uh, slipping down the bank and had to be rescued. Uh, but soon enough, we moved up on the hill behind the city park, and uh, that's where most of my memories begin. So let me, let me share a few thoughts uh, and, and stories, which I have entitled in the, uh, in the book, um, Family Life, Under Family Life. And I, I have each section is portrayed by a portrait, uh, uh, actually a, a, the note card that Noel Tenney had published in the past Here's a beautiful uh, scene of uh, strawberries that have been picked in a kitchen and a very homey, very uh, inviting scene. 
and uh, not a, not different at all from my recollections of our own kitchen growing up. And so, uh, an appropriate print to begin the section called Family Life. <clears throat> I'll share a story about, I call this New Beginnings. Uh, we have always had a collie dog, and our collie dogs have always been named Briar. And uh, I've, of course, been named Greenbriar. Uh, and uh, so I have a union with the dog, don't I? Uh, and I had the first Briar dog, uh, and he it was a sheep dog. Uh, we had, uh, picked him up in Nebraska when mom and dad moved there, and uh, dad was in the Army Air Corps. And uh, what, one year he was assigned uh, to Japan. Uh, but uh, anyway, I was born, and we needed a dog a companion, and, and uh, we had our first briar. <clears throat> in, in my story, I recall what mom and dad told me about the parting. Uh, as they, they were ready to come back to West Virginia, dad was discharged from the service. Uh, they loaded up their 1938 Chevrolet uh, to the top, and they, they could carry everything they could carry. And they had myself and my sister Kay, also born in Nebraska, uh, but they didn't have room for the dog, so they decided to take it out to a sheep farm and, and turn it over to the farmer, and uh, he would take good care of him. And so, so we had a parting moment when I uh, was uh, uh, asking my dog to go chase the sheep, and he wasn't sure he wanted to do that, but in his heart he wanted to do it. And so we parted, uh, parted friends and, and free. And then we headed back to uh, West Virginia. Uh, and Dad and Mom told the story many times of what I did on the way. They called me a Nebraska rascal, but uh, what I did, uh, I guess I was helping to powder my sister uh, with some baby powder, uh, but, but I, I threw the powder up in the air, and of course back in those days there was no air conditioning, the windows would be open, and, and so the, the, the powder <coughs> flew out the window and, and up in the air and, and uh, landed uh, right in the middle of a car behind us, uh, I think on the windshield, and, 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 and the... Uh, the can or, or whatever the container was, maybe a paper bag, I don't know, but anyway, it ruptured and, and burst and spread the powder all over the place. And the poor man in the back, probably spooked from World War II, um, thought it was a bomb and thought that Dad was doing something sinister. Well, of course, then Dad knew he was in trouble. The man kept honking and wanting Dad to stop, and Dad didn't want to stop. And finally, the man passed Dad and pulled him off the road and well, I wanted to confront Dad and, you know, probably beat him up, but uh, Dad explained that it was just a little boy named Greenbrier uh, going back to West Virginia to throw the baby powder up in the air, and the man could scarcely believe it, but um, as my parents said, we certainly earned the title Nebraska Rascal that day. So that's one of our new beginning stories. Um, <clears throat> another fond memory I, I entitled zippity doo -dah. Uh, zippity doo -dah, of course, is a refrain from the Walt Disney movie about Burr Rabbit, and there's a wonderful song that I, I sometimes sing, I won't sing tonight, about zippity doo -dah. and uh, but, but I, I portray or discuss uh, my memory over the years of a bedtime in our home. Uh, Dad's uh, custom was to tell us a Br'er Rabbit story before we would go to sleep, and it was a wonderful ritual. Um, because, well, it would quiet down uh, eventually four girls and myself, so we would be ready for sleep. It would bring us to a, a point, perhaps about eight o'clock or so, when we would be able to be tucked into bed. We'd hurry through our baths and get ready and, you know, lay out our clothes for tomorrow and everything would be in readiness for that story so we could hear that and then go to sleep. And uh, so we would gather in mom and dad's bed, uh, which was a double bed, and, and, uh, Dad would lay down across the back of the bed, and we'd be uh, lying there in the bed, and and uh, <clears throat> he would uh, begin, uh, where was I last night? And of course, Br'er Rabbit's story, if you know the heart of that, the Joel Chandler Harris stories, Uncle Remus stories, uh, they, they, uh, Br'er Rabbit is always outsmarting Br'er Fox, and uh, it's a wonderful series, um, one of the most beloved series in all American literature. And so, uh, my, Kay, my sister Kay, would, who always tracked stories better than I did, would know where Dad had left off the night before, and then Dad would pick up from there and tell a little bit more of the Br'er Rabbit stories. And then we would, um, we would all enjoy that, and then eventually we would be very sleepy, not very, not very many long, really. 
And then dad would carry us to our bed. And perhaps as I was getting older, he would sort of walk me, lead me to my bed. But I, I would um, be up the hall and have a separate bedroom. And, and then his dad would uh, tuck me in. He'd rub his uh, beard, uh, which was a, he didn't have a beard like I do, but it was a, the whiskers growth for that day. <clears throat> and it would be a sort of stubble by that time of evening. And he would ask me if it were whiskers like Br'er Rabbit had. And of course, I remember going to sleep and, and, and dreaming about being Br'er Rabbit and, and twirling my whiskers and going down the road. I'll tell you a variation of this story in addition, uh, the whisker part of it. I had always wanted to grow whiskers and, and uh, I couldn't do it in high school. Um, I think we had a dress code and maybe I couldn't even grow whiskers. But anyway, I, I didn't do that. But when I went to Westlane, I, I thought it was time uh, to try to grow a beard. And, and so I, would, I did that, and I, and I was pretty successful. At least I was proud of it. And uh, I was staying at home and going to college, <clears throat> and I would go down early in the morning and stay all day and come back in the evening and participate in college life as much as I wanted to, but I, I would just be sleeping at home up on the hill. So uh, I'd have to walk by Miss Dorothy Cookman's house uh, at the bottom of our hill. This is where uh, Dr. Kirk and Dr. Kirchdorfer live now, right next to our present academy school, a red frame house. And this was uh, Dr. Cookman's house, uh, and, and, and Dorothy Cookman was his daughter, and uh, a, a lady who never married, but was an excellent, excellent fourth grade teacher at academy. Anyway, I loved her a lot, and, uh, and I was walking down the street, and she saw me, and she greeted me, and she was pleased to see me, and then she looked at me in all earnestness, and I said, what is that on your, on your uh, face, on your chin? What is that on your chin, she said. And, and it sounded stern. My goodness, I thought, uh-oh, I, I have egg on my chin. You know, I, I ate too fast in the morning. I, I, didn't, I didn't wipe off my face or something. And, and, and I started rubbing. And she says, no, that beard. She said, take that thing off. <laughs> well, she frightened me. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm still a fourth grader when I'm around her. And, I, um, and she frightened me. And I, and I, I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Well, I went to college that day, and I came back, and, and I took that beard off, and I didn't even grow it again until I was in medical school, uh, I guess in deference to Miss Cookman. But I always wanted one, and it came out of my father's telling the bedtime stories. <coughs> <coughs> Another story in the book uh, I've entitled The Big T's. Uh, one of my problems with having four sisters uh, was always that I would tease my sisters. I don't think I was a mean tease uh, or bully, but, but uh, I just wanted to tease them. I don't know, uh, something about being a boy and having sisters. Uh, but my mom always wanted me to be kind and gentle and, and, uh, and not tease my sisters, and I would be punished for it, and I'd try to learn the lesson. Well, on this particular day that I recall in the book, uh, <clears throat> this was my 13th birthday, and uh, we had, uh, my, uh, my birthday is January the 23rd, and we had the most wonderful snowstorm, and, and it was a blizzard, really, and we had no school. School was called off, and I mean, um, for all the kids, I, I'm on the Board of Education, and I, I follow the, uh, the weather, of course, and, and, the, and when we're going to have a, a snow day, uh, and, I, and I remembered, every time we have a snow day, I remember how wonderful those were when we were kids and what we looked forward to. I know it wrecks havoc on the home. People have to change their schedule. The kids are at home. Uh, I know that it's probably hard on the teachers. Um, lesson plans cannot be carried out, and then they have to be sort of uh, double, double time later on to catch up. <clears throat> but for, for a kid, it's wonderful. And so on my birthday, 13th birthday of all things, very important birthday, um, I had the opportunity to stay home from school. And we went sleigh riding to our heart's content, and uh, we would stay out as long as we could. Our hands would be really, really cold, and our feet cold and wet. We would stay and sleigh ride as much as we could, and and I loved it. And uh, but finally, we got really frozen, and we came in and warmed up in front of the fireplace, and and mother made hot chocolate, and and then I went down to play in the basement. I think she shooed us downstairs to get us out of the way a little bit, and uh, we had our ping pong table. We had. Uh, a lot of things to do, but we had some bikes, but mostly for summer riding outdoors. But on this particular day, I, I teased my sister Ruthie, who had a little red bike, and I took it from her, and I was riding it around the, 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 the furnace, a big old gas furnace in the middle of the basement, and then around the chimney, 
We have a chimney that goes down and empties the ice in the basement <coughs> around our ping pong table. And I was just riding everywhere and, and uh, staying ahead of her as she chased me and, and wanted her bike. And, and I, I kept going faster and faster. Finally, I went around a pole and I hit our uh, rock press. We had a, we had a, a big uh, a rock, um, um, well, cu rock cutter. We had we had um, a tumbler. We had a setup for making uh, wonderful uh, necklaces and 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 tie tie pins and earrings and all sorts of things out of rocks. And my uncle Paul was well, quite a collector, but it, it was a it was a very sturdy piece of furniture. And I hit it head on, and I broke my leg. I immediately knew from Dad teaching me the bones that I had broken. Uh, a, a leg bone, and, and it turned out to be my fibula. Dad had to have me x-rayed, and, and uh, then I had to have a plaster cast, and of course my, my birthday party that night was pretty subdued. Uh, but, I, but as I say in the book, I, I got my comeuppance as a big tease, uh, the old mountain term for um, having too much pride and, and uh, getting that pride broken. I had my comeuppance. Another story I'd like to share tonight, and all these are from my family life section. Uh, the book by, its, by itself has, has uh, several sections. I won't have time or want to go over those all, but there's one section on friends, one section on community life growing up here in Buchanan, a, a section on school, a section I entitled Expanding Horizons, and then one on Upshur County of that era. So um, <clears throat> I, I hope you are interested. I hope I'm wetting your whistle a little bit. Uh, by telling you some of these stories tonight, but these are all about the, the family life section. Uh, well, I had, we had uh, relatives live with us. Um, this is the custom of growing up. My grandparents lived close to us at the bottom of the hill. Uh, my grandmother's um, brother, uh, Uncle Paul, great Uncle Paul, lived with us in our garage apartment, and we had other people living with us over the years. I think at one point, Mother counted up 99 people that lived with us over time made life very exciting besides the five of us, and, uh, and our house was always open. Uh, but on this particular time, I'm in the third grade, and uh, I recall uh, being in Miss Swisher's class, the old academy school building, and it was, uh, uh, this was carnival night. <coughs> school carnivals were always a lot of fun, and uh, we would uh, do very many things, uh, a lot of things, cakewalks and, and uh, Sometimes there'd be a movie, a Walt Disney movie we could see. Uh, we, we, we played all sorts of games. Um, but this particular night, Miss uh, Swisher's class was set up for fortune telling. And there was a, a turbaned uh, man, a, a professor, he sounded like uh, George Rosbach to me from the college because I knew him. Uh, my parents were interested in biology, my mother was a biology major. But anyway, that night he was in disguise and I didn't really, wasn't sure that it was him or not. But but he was the fortune teller. And, and I sat down, paid my dime, and, and uh, he began to uh, ask to see my hand, and, and then he began to study my palm, and as fortune tellers do, and, and he was really acting out. It was a, it was a, he was a great, great um, fortune teller that night. But he made something up, I, I imagine, but, but he said, um, he said, your, your future looks great. I see rocks of many sizes and many colors. I see diamonds, emeralds, gold, even pearls. Well, that really thrilled me. Uh, and I, uh, to be honest, I probably had not thought about rocks at all uh, th at that time, except to throw them in the river and skip them, uh, and, and maybe to make a big splash and things like that. But, but I, I went home and I told my Uncle Paul about my fortune, that I was going to um, have a fortune with rocks. And, <clears throat> and he was thrilled with that because he loved rocks. Uh, he had traveled even as far as uh, Grand Canyon to get rocks. And at those times, people would travel all over America, they would get rocks, and they would make a fireplace, and they would put rocks from various places uh, that they had traveled within, embedded in the fireplace. And he, I don't think he'd done that per se, but, but that was how people were interested in rocks, and, and he was certainly a leading collector of rocks. And uh, so, uh, so he was thrilled that I was, uh, my fortune involved rocks. And, course, I told my grandmother, and, and she, she had a rock garden. Uh, she would make rock walls, uh, and uh, she, there were a lot of, lot of rocks in her soil, in her garden, there on Victoria Hill. 
and uh, we were always digging them out. And she insisted each year that there were more rocks down below somehow coming up, uh, growing in her garden even. And, uh, but, but I helped her a lot with her rock beds, her rock gardens. And then, and then uh, my mother uh, realized that we, the tallest mountain in West Virginia is Spruce Knob, and that we as a family had not been to Spruce Knob, but West Virginians, being enterprising, wanted to make Spruce Knob a mile high. And it's shy of that, but, but they've been stacking rock up on top of, of Spruce Knob, uh, making the mountain higher and higher and higher until it's a mile high. So she said, well, let's go. Uh, we'll go see Spruce Knob, we'll get some rocks, we'll add them to, to the pile. And it was a great outing, we had a wonderful time. Uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my dad, my dad had, uh, was interested in rocks then all of a sudden and said we need to do the, uh, the seven wonders of Upshur County. Well, you know, there are seven wonders of the ancient world and, and uh, that, that's been a concept that has thrilled people a long time, but he wanted to do the seven wonders of Upshur County. And so we did that. We, 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 uh, we went out to, to uh, uh, Carter, West Virginia, out uh, beyond the game farm going towards Selbyville. Uh, there's a community where there's a natural bridge and there's a, a wonderful little a meadow stream that flows under a, a large rock and then the highway department has taken the top of the rock and just incorporated that into as a natural bridge that, that people drive over as they go down that road. And so we went there and we explored that and, and had a great time. Uh, I think we met uh, the Golden family, <coughs> Harley Golden, Golden and his family at that time. And, and that was a great side trip. Uh, coming out of my fortune telling experience at, and uh, Years later, as I say in, in the book, uh, reflecting on this story, I met my wife, Arasley, who is from the Philippine Islands. And the Philippines, I mean, for those who haven't traveled there, I hope you get a chance to do that, but you can imagine how, we know a lot about how beautiful the Hawaiian Islands are. Well, the Philippines are, are just as tremendous, but instead of about six islands as the Hawaiian Islands are, there are 7,200 islands. And, and it's called the Pearl of the Pacific because it's like a necklace of pearls flung across the ocean uh, over a wide, wide area. I think it would encompass most of America, uh, but, but the islands are small. <coughs> My wife grew up on an island about the size of Upshur County, about 10 miles across and 30 miles long, with a great big uh, volcanic uh, peak in the middle of it. And we love that island. And so I, that was part of my fortune. And so, so I say that uh, also many moons later, uh, Arasley and I planted our own flowers in our own flower garden, our own rock garden, in our own side yard, uh, beside a very pleasant street that the Indians called White Rock, or we call Kanoa. And, uh, and of course, that's where we live. We have Kanoa Street here in Buchanan. And I say, how fortune has smiled on me. So, my rock hound uh, story. And these are, these are, of course, for the grandchildren, I'm hoping that I uh, will get things recorded. I would encourage you, don't just listen to this talk and, and say this is very interesting, but if you have grandchildren uh, or, or you have nieces or nephews or uh, you, you have stories from your youth, uh, write them down. Uh, talk them into a tape recorder. Um, uh, get a video camera and have, have someone... Uh, savvy with that, uh, record your stories and, uh, and maybe even put them into a book form. It's easy to self-publish. It's not, not very complex at all. I know McLean Publishing has helped Dad and now myself and we're very pleased with what they do. But there are other people who do that around West Virginia. But the important thing is these stories are, are stories from a bygone era and uh, if you have grandchildren you want them to know that and, and certainly I do uh, for our children. One, another story uh, that I wanted to emphasize uh, tonight about family, uh, I, I just call it like uh, fair play or playing the game fair or learning how to play the game of life. And uh, I've heard this saying all my life, it's not about winning or losing, it's about how you play the game. And that's an important concept. And uh, we, we began to learn that in our family, uh, thanks to my Uncle Kester in part. This would be my mother's uh, half-brother and, and he grew up after his mother had died um, and, and, and then his father remarried and um, <clears throat> he was a teenager, it was a rough time. Eventually 
uh, of course, the Depression was going on, World War II was going on, he joined the Navy. He saw the world, he, he, he did many things, a marvelous man. And uh, at the end of my, uh, my grandparents, Flanagan's 50-year uh, itinerant ministry in the Methodist Church, uh, he uh, came over to Buchanan and spent a year or so building a wonderful little cottage for them on Victoria Street. And, uh, and uh, so he was very talented in many ways. But we had a joke in our family, which I started. I, I had, uh, uh, we, we had little uh, slideshows at that time. And uh, Mother projected the, the, uh, on the wall. We had a white wall, project the picture on the wall. And then we would run over and point out people that we knew. And, uh, and then we would um, you know, maybe talk about what we were doing in that particular slide. And it was a storytelling time all up to itself. It was a wonderful experience to listen to slideshows. Well, at this particular time, Uncle Kester was portrayed in the picture. And I rushed over to point him out. <coughs> And just at that moment, my sister or my mother took out the slide and was changing it. And so I ended up pointing at a blank wall. And we began to laugh because Uncle Kester was here and there and all over the world. And, and, but for us, many times, he was a blank wall. He was a blank. We didn't, we didn't see him. And we began to laugh about that even. Uh, but but uh, Uncle Kester uh, left us a ping pong table uh, on one occasion, and we uh, put that in our basement. Mom and Dad taught us about fair play and about playing ping pong. Um, and so we, um, we on the hilltop, uh, we had a lot of kids. Uh, the Morgan family lived there. Uh, it was Dave and Danny, and they, they, they played ping pong, and they both became champions at the high school uh, in intramural ping pong. And then, and then Danny Daniel, my best friend growing up, uh, we, he played ping pong, of course, with us, and he became champion in the high school. And then up on Water Tank Hill was Bill Schistler, uh, and Bill came down and played ping pong with us all the time. And, and as he became a senior, he, he uh, was a champion of ping pong at the high school. And so now it's my turn. I'm a senior, I'm, I'm a great ping pong player, and I, I go to play the, in the intramural match, and lo and behold, I, I get beat by a uh, student, Laura uh, Turlakpote. And Laura has uh, had come from Holland. Her family had come from Holland. This, her father was teaching at Westland, and uh, I know that uh, probably they were, played a lot of ping pong because she was very, very good. In fact, she beat me. Uh, so uh, what can you do? I mean, you know, you get beat by a girl. That's that's humiliating in a way. But Uncle Kester had taught taught about fair play, and uh, and I thought, well, I need to be kind and gentle and and fair about this, and so I, uh, we were, it's about prom time, I never dated seriously in high school, but I wanted to go to the prom, so I asked Laura if she would go with me to the prom, and lo and behold, she said no. Uh, she, was, she was going with my friend Brent Reed, and she did that, and, and they had a good time, and I eventually had a prom date, but, but, uh, but I say in, in my story, I say, uh, Uncle Kester, I need another lesson about you, about winning and losing at life. Um, so there are a lot of lessons we learn uh, from our family, including fair play and winning and losing in life. Uh, in a closing moment here, let me share also, uh, I won't share any more stories, but, but the fact that, that I had a lot of Bible teaching growing up, and I value that. And uh, when I was working at Rock Cave for seven years, uh, I would t tell the kids sometimes about a rainbow. Rainbows were big deals in our home. And, um, and the kids would not understand that concept that, that that was a sign or promise from God in the heavens that there would never be another flood over the earth in the, in the time of Noah. <coughs> and that's a sad, sad that it's not commonly known, that story is not commonly known to the children, even here in Upshur County. But, but I, I tell the rainbow story and uh, how it was shown in our house. I tell a, a story about going to the World Series game I talk about my parents, uh, my grandparents teaching me how to, to uh, be kind to those who may be handicapped or, or less fortunate. Uh, talk about the value of listening to the whippoorwill in nature. All sorts of family stories. So I hope that if you're interested in this at all, it's, it's in the local bookstores, it's in the Historic Society book uh, store, it's in the, uh, the Arts Co-op on Main Street, and, and you can go get it online at Amazon.com. It's one of three of a series now, 
and I hope you do consider getting that. Well, until the next time, this is Dr. Greenbrier Allman thanking you for joining us on our program, Tender Loving Care. Special thanks for Channel 3 for this opportunity to come your way each week. We'll see you next week.